Hello, Booktube. It's Peg. Welcome back to the History Shelf. Today, we've got some new books to show you. We have books from publishers. We have brand new history books, um, things that I think you might find interesting and I want to highlight to you. Um, I also have four books I've been meaning to show you that I picked up from um, the last Princeton University Press sale a few months ago. Uh, I'm a little bit tardy, a little remiss in getting uh, these books to you and showing you what they are. I apologize for that. Uh, but they are all of the Princeton Classics line, so they all have a very distinct look, uh, look and feel. But they're beautiful books and with very intriguing topics, so I wanted to share them with you. Um, but let's start off with, whoa, I'm dropping things left and right over here at the history shelf. Uh, all right, so the first book, um, this has been out I think for a couple months now, but I just got my hands on it. Not too long ago, this um, actually, yeah, this came out, oh, this came out late last year, I think. I'm sorry, guys, I've been a little tardy in showing you this one. The rest are very new, but this is from Oxford University Press. This is The Education of John Adams by R.B. Bernstein. And um, I know that several other booktubers were doing a read-along for John Adams, the uh, biography on da by David McCullough, and uh, Christy Lewis at Dostoevsky in Space. I know she has now uh, proclaimed from the, the rooftops that John Adams is her favorite founding father. And I can't, I don't disagree with her. I, I, he's one of my favorites too. Um, so I think Christy Lewis might really be interested in this book. But uh, yeah, this came out late 2020. And I'll give you a brief synopsis. The Education of John Adams is the first biography of John Adams by a biographer with legal training. Okay. It examines his origins in colonial Massachusetts, his education, and his struggle to choose a career and define a place for himself in colonial society. It explores the flowering of his legal career and the impact that law had on him and his understanding of himself. His growing involvement with the emerging American Revolution as a polemicist, as lawyer, as congressional delegate, and as diplomat, and his commitment to defining and expounding ideas about constitutionalism and how it should work as the body of ideas shaping the new United States. Um, this book traces his part in launching the new government of the United States under the U.S. Constitution, his service as the nation's first vice president and second president, and his retirement years during which he was first a vexed and rejected ex-president and then became the revered sage of Braintree. It describes the relationships that sustained him with his wife, the brilliant and eloquent Abigail Adams, with his children, with such allies and supporters as Benjamin Rush and John Marshall with such sometime friends and sometime adversaries as ben Benjamin Franklin, George Washington, and of course, Thomas Jefferson. Um, and with such foes as Alexander Hamilton and Timothy Pickering. Bernstein establishes Adams as a key but neglected figure in the evolution of American constitutional theory and practice. Hmm. And it claims here that this is the first biography to examine Adams's conflicted and hesitant ideas about slavery and race in the American context, raising serious questions about his mythic status as a friend of human equality and a foe of slavery. Well, that should be fascinating. Um, this book's foundation is the record left by Adams himself in diaries, letters, essays, pamphlets, and books. Oh, so this, this is gonna be a really, really fascinating read. So this is the education of John Adams by Oxford University Press. Christy, I know that you'll be wanting to read this. <laughs> uh, all right. Oh, yes. All right. I was so excited to see this book. You know, I am a big follower of Unity University Presses. I'm always browsing different University Press websites uh, to see what kind of new history is coming out. Um, uh, and this is right up my alley because I've always had a fascination with this guy. Um, he's better known as the, as the, uh, the younger pair um, of Hindenburg and Ludendorff, but this is about Ludendorff. This is Dragon Slayer, the legend of Eric Ludendorff in the Weimar Republic and Third Reich by J. Lachenur. Uh, this is put out by Cornell University Press. 
Uh, this is a brand new book. Um, you know, you don't see a lot of biographies on Ludendorff. You usually see a lot of uh, books kind of just writing on the the military history of, or at least the strategies of Hindenburg and Ludendorff in World War I. Uh, you know, they're always kind of grouped together. And this book, again, just, just came out, I think about a month ago, um, is uh, fascinating. Then this fascinating biography of the infamous ideologue Eric Ludendorff, J. Lachenur, Com uh, ooh, complicates the classic depiction of this German World War I hero. Let's hear it. Eric Ludendorff created for himself a persona that secured his place as one of the most prominent and despicable Germans of the 20th century. With boundless energy and an obsession with detail, Ludendorff ascended to power and solidified a stable public position among Germany's most influential. Between 1914 and his death in 1937, he was a war hero, a dictator, a right-wing activist, a failed putschist, a presidential candidate, a publisher, and a would-be prophet. He guided Germany's effort in the Great War between 1916 and 1918, and importantly, set the tone for a politics of victimhood and revenge in the post-war era. Dragon Slayer explores Ludendorff's life after 1918, arguing that the strange or unhinged personal traits most historians attribute to mental collapse were, in fact, integral to Ludendorff's political strategy. Lacanur asserts that Ludendorff patterned himself, sometimes consciously and sometimes unconsciously, on the Dragon Slayer of Germanic mythology Siegfried, hero of the epic poem The Nibelungenlied. The Niebe, Nibelungenlied, there you go, and, and much admired by German intellectual, or German nationalists, sorry. The symbolic power of this myth allowed Ludendorff to embody many Germans' fantasies of revenge after their defeat in 1918, keeping him relevant to political discourse despite his failure to hold high office or cultivate a mass following after World War I. Um... So the book reveals the influence that Ludendorff's post-war career had on Germany's political culture and radical right during this tumultuous era. It is a tale as fabulous as fiction. So I never knew that about uh, Ludendorff. I had no idea that he, he thought of himself as some type of latter-day Siegfried, like a literal dragon slayer. But uh, I'm fascinated. Sign me up. Cornell University Press. All right. Next new book, this is, uh, I think, getting a lot of buzz right now. This is put out by Crown Publishing. And I love these type of books. Oh, my gosh. I love these type of stories, these type of histories um, of, like, polar exploration, um, mostly, like, with uh, the men in the ships, the Northwest, Northwest Passage, or anything having to do with Antarctica. I eat it up. Um, in fact, I think the, the most recent book I read on that was... Um, Come on, where's the title? I did a review for it for Open Letters Review. Oh, I can see the cover. It was by Buddy Levy. Oh, it'll come to me. Hang on. Um, but this is another great rousing type of adventure survival tale. Um, and this is Madhouse at the End of the Earth. The Belgica's, I think it's Belgica. Belgica's Journey into the Dark Antarctic Night by Julian Sankton. Isn't that a beautiful cover? Oy. Whenever I see a cover like that, I'm like, yeah, give it to me. Um, I love Antarctic or Arctic survivor, survival tales. Um, uh, and I had never heard of the Belgica. Sorry for the, the, the rough edit there. I, my video stopped recording. So what I was doing was reading you the synopsis, which I'll have to read again. Um, no problem, though. In August 1897, the young Belgian commandant, Adrian de Gerlache, set sail for a three-year expedition aboard the good ship Belgica with dreams of glory. His destination was the uncharted end of the earth, the icy continent of Antarctica. But de Gerlache's plans to be first to the magnetic South Pole would swiftly go awry. After a series of costly setbacks, the commandant faced two bad options. Turn back in defeat and spare his men the devastating Antarctic winter, or recklessly chase fame by sailing deeper into the freezing waters. 
guess we can guess what he did. De Gerlache sailed on, and soon the Belgica was stuck fast in the icy hold of the Bellingshausen Sea. When the sun set on the magnificent polar landscape one last time, the ship's occupants were condemned to months of endless night. In the darkness, plagued by a mysterious illness and besieged by monotony, they descended into madness. Hence the madhouse at the end of the earth. Isn't that a great title? Wow. It's chilling. <laughs> no pun intended. But uh, madhouse at the end of the earth. Wow. Um, Julian Sancton unfolds an epic story of adventure and horror for the ages. As the Belgica's men teetered on the brink, de Gerlache relied increasingly on two young officers whose friendship had blossomed in, in captivity. The expedition's lone American, Dr. Frederick Cook, half genius, half con man, um, whose later infamy would overshadow his brilliance on the Belgica, and the ship's first mate, soon to be legendary Roald Amundsen even in his youth, the storybook picture of a sailor. Together, they would plan a last-ditch, nearly certain-to-fail escape from the ice, one that would either etch their names in history or doom them to a terrible fate at the ocean's bottom. Equal parts maritime thriller and gothic horror, Madhouse at the End of the Earth is an unforgettable journey into the deep. So I figured you guys would just be all over this. Um, you probably have already heard of this in your you know your networks all you history lovers out there but i had to show this one i am so excited to read this i cannot get enough of these uh, arctic antarctic survival tales all right the next new book this is going to be interesting this is also from oxford university press this i got this very recently just maybe about a week or so ago brand new book um, I've always been interested in dictators, as you know. I sub-minor in dictators. Um, but I haven't read a lot about Tito. And no, I'm not talking about Michael Jackson's brother. I'm talking about uh, this Tito. <laughs> right here. We're talking about Tito's sacred empire. How the Maharaja of the Balkans fooled the world. By William Klinger and Dennis Kuljus. Um... Yeah, so let me read a quick synopsis of this for you. The dog has to go out. I'll be right back. And we're back. All right, back to Tito, Tito's secret empire. Uh, this groundbreak groundbreaking biography of Marshal Tito of Yugoslavia presents many startling new revelations. Among them, his role as an international revolutionary leader and his relationship with Winston Churchill. It highlights his early years as a common turn operative, the context for his later politics as a leader of the non-aligned movement, also known as the NAM. The authors argue that in the 1940s, between the dissolution of the common turn and the rise of the NAM, Tito's influence and ambition were far greater than has been understood, extending to Italy, France, Greece, and Spain via the international communist networks established during the Spanish Civil War. Klinger and Kuljis disclosed for the first time the connection between Tito's expulsion from the common form and the Rome assassination attempt on the Italian Communist Party leader Palmiro Togliatti, the man who had plotted to overthrow Tito. Sounds awesome. <laughs> Love all this intrigue. Sounds like a movie plot or something, but it's real. History is so much more fascinating than fiction sometimes, I tell ya. Tito's secret empire offers a, offers a pivotal contribution to our understanding of Tito as a figure of real rather than imagined global significance. This dazzling, dazzlingly original book will reward all those who are interested in the history of international communism, the Cold War. I mean, I'm not cheering for, I mean, that's me. I've always been interested in reading about the, you know, the history of communism and all that. Okay. <laughs> the Cold War and the non-aligned movement, which I don't know a lot about, uh, the non-aligned movement. So I really love learning new things. So this will be fantastic. Um, so it's a reward for all those who are interested in those things. Plus, Orin Tito, the, ma the man, one of the most significant leaders of the 20th century. Like I said, I don't know a lot about Tito. I've heard, I've heard his name mentioned many times. Uh, tangentially to some of the studies I've, or histories I've read on Stalin. Um, I know he was irritated with Tito a lot. 
Um, but yeah, I would definitely want to, you know, learn more about the guy and, uh, you know, check out some of these assertions the authors are making. But yeah, this is a brand new book from Oxford University Press, guys. So if you're interested, um, yeah, let me know. And let me know. Um, again, I'd like to nice, nice spine on this book, too. This, this, is, this looks like Khrushchev here. Is this Khrushchev? I think so. Anyway, Tito's Secret Empire, brand new. And then I have two books um, that the lovely people at Savas Beatty um, offered to send me. They had uh, they reached out to me. They had two new releases, um, relatively recent, I think in the last few months. Um, and Savas Beatty is an independent publishing uh, company that they focus a lot on the Civil War and uh, also Revolutionary War, American Revolution. So. And I have many of their books. They do a lot of books on like, get, uh, you know, tour book guides. I mean, they're books that you can use at the different battlegrounds for Civil War battlefields. But they also do individual volumes on um, different campaigns that they're, they're very detailed and in-depth. Um, but the first one, and I was like very excited to read this. I might, yeah, this, it looks familiar, like I might have shown this to you before, but I don't think I received this from them before. This is by Stephen M. Hood, who wrote a biography on his, his ancestor, uh, John Bell Hood. So they are related. But this is a new book called Patriots Twice, Former Confederates and the Building of America After the Civil War by Stephen M. Hood. Um, I'm always interested in how, um, you know, the, the veterans on, on both sides came together or how often they didn't. But in this case, you know, what happened after the war and how did these, how did these people transition back in? Um, so it's a little slim volume. It's about 180 pages, uh, pictures of a, a lot of the, the, the guys the ex-Confederates uh, and what they did, you know, to, I don't know, to, to, be, to be patriots again. But anyway, let me read this to you real quickly. Um, okay. Well, there's a big preface. Okay, I'll just read it. The long and bloody American Civil War claimed the lives of more than 700,000 men. When it ended, former opponents worked to rebuild their reunified nation and moved into the future together. Many people will find that hard to believe, especially in an era witnessing the destruction or removal of Confederate monuments and the, des and the desecration of Confederate cemeteries. In the unique and timely Patriots Twice, former Confederates in the Building of America, after the Civil War, award-winning author Stephen M. Hood identifies more than 300 former Confederate soldiers, sailors, and government officials who reintegrated into American society and attained positions of authority and influence in the federal government, the United States military, academia, science, commerce, and industry. Their contributions had a long-lasting and positive influence on the country we have today. Uh, many of the facts in Patriots Twice will surprise modern Americans. For example, 10 post-war presidents appointed former Confederates to serve the, re the reunited nation as Supreme Court justices. What? Uh, secretaries of the U.S. Navy, attorneys general, and a secretary of the interior. Dozens of former Southern, Southern soldiers were named U.S. ambassadors and consuls, and eight were appointed generals who commanded U.S. Army troops during the Spanish-American War. I'm not surprised by that. Uh, and then it goes on to say how many more were elected as, you know, mayors and, and you know, governors and, and all this kind of stuff. But, uh, yeah, this is, it's interesting. And I think each, each one is just kind of given like a biographical, um, oh, they're, okay, it's, it's broken up into sections. So, um, part one is United States presidential administrations. Part two, United States Congress. Part three, United States military. Uh, four is governors. Then you have city founders and mayors, uh, officers of professional societies, higher education. And then it, it groups them into those categories and gives you like a biographical, almost like an encyclopedic um, uh, 
entry. You know what I'm saying? So that sounds interesting. So that's from Savas Beatty, Patriots Twice. I'm looking forward to that, adding that to the Civil War reading list. And then we move to American Revolution, you guys. This is a brand new book. I think it came out late last year, 2020. And for all of you American Revolution fans out there or George Washington fans, we have George Washington's nemesis. The outrageous treason and unfair court-martial of Major General Charles Lee during the Revolutionary War by Christian McBurney. That sounds really good. That sounds juicy. Um, <laughs> let's take a look at this. Revolutionary War historians and biographers of Charles Lee have treated him as either an inveterate enemy of George Washington or a great defender of American liberty. Neither approach is accurate. According to author Christian McBurney, absolute objectivity is required to fully understand the war's most complicated general. Now, I have to say, I know more about the Civil War than I do American Revolution. Uh, I know more politically uh, about the American Revolution. I, I, wanna, I haven't really studied military campaigns in depth of the American Revolution, which is an area that I want to rec rectify that. Oh, probably in the next year, I really want to put together a plan of reading that g gets me fully immersed in the chronology of the different battles, the generals, you know, officers and things like that. Um, so I haven't really heard too much about Charles Lee. So again, this is another book where I'm learning something new and I love it. Um, I get really excited. All right. So we're back here. Um, Okay, so with McBurney's new book here, um, it relies on original documents, some newly discovered, to combine two dramatic stories involving the military law of treason and court martials, or is it courts martial? Mm -hmm. Creating a balanced view of one of the revolution's most fascinating personalities. Okay, give me a little bit here about Lee. General Lee, second in command in the Continental Army, led by George Washington, was captured by the British in December 17, 1776. While a prisoner, he prepared and submitted to his captors a military plan on how to defeat Washington, Washington's army as quickly as possible. That's not good. Um, this extraordinary act of treason, arguably on a par with Benedict Arnold's heinous treachery, was not discovered during his lifetime. Many historians shrug off this ignoble act, but it should not be ignored. Less well known is that throughout his 16 months of captivity and even after his release, Lee continued communicating with the enemy, offering to help negotiate an end of the rebellion. That's Galawag. After Lee rejoined the Continental Army, he was given command of many of its best troops together with orders from Washington to attack the rear of British General Henry Clinton's Henry Clinton's column near Monmouth, New Jersey. Lee intended to attack on June 28, 1778, but retreated in the face of Clinton's bold move to reverse his march. Two of Lee's subordinate generals, without orders and without informing Lee, moved more than half of his command off the field. Faced with the possible destruction of the balance, Lee ordered a general retreat while conducting a skillful delaying action. Many historians have been quick to malign Lee's performance at Monmouth, for which he was convicted by court-martial for not attacking and for retreating in the face of the enemy. McBurney, for the evidence... Uh, wait, so I just jumped. Okay, so this was a miscarriage of justice, stresses McBurney, for the evidence clearly shows Lee was unfairly convicted and had, in fact, by retreating, performed an important service to the Patriot cause. The guilty verdict was more the result of Lee's having insulted Washington, which made the matter a political contest between the Army's top two top generals, only one of whom could prevail. Ooh. So, McBurney's George Washington's nemesis is a gripping, a fast-paced study that relies on facts, logic, and hard evidence to set the historical record straight. Well, we know he's got an agenda here. He really wants to advocate for Lee here. Um, by using, and I quote, logic, facts, and hard evidence. I would hope so. <laughs> As a historian, I really, that should go without saying. But, um, hey man, like I said, I'm trying to bone up more on American Revolution uh, military aspects and battles and leaders, and I'm not, and I didn't, I don't really know a lot about 
Charles Lee. You know, I've read a lot about Light Horse Harry Lee, but not Charles Lee. So looking forward to this. Thank you, Savis Beatty. Okay. So um, let me see. Hang, hang on here. I was going to see if I had any other new ones that I've on my are on my sorting my sorting shelf that are next to me when new books come in. I, I kind of stage them here so that I can show you new books that are um, coming online for everybody. Um, but the, I think the, that's it for now. I think I'm getting sent some more. <laughs> um, so there'll be another video again soon. A lot of, lot of uh, new books crossing the, the, uh, the, the circulation desk here at the history shelf. But I love it. Um, okay, so, but the, the next four books are books that I, um, I went and splurged on myself at the Princeton University Press. I don't know why I started talking like that. One moment. And, yeah, they had a big sale, and I just decided, okay, one of these is not a Princeton Classics, but, sorry, two of these are, two, two of the others are not. Anyway, um, I had bought a few of them in an earlier haul that I showed you guys, but then I went back and decided I wanted to get two more. And this is a book I've been meaning to read for a while, and it needs to be on my shelf next to... Um, the Opium of the Intellectuals. I feel like this one needs to sit along right next to it. Um, Opium of the Intellectuals by Raymond Aaron. Yes. And then you can't have Aaron without Popper. I'm not making any jokes about Popper. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm having a weird day. Um, yeah, this has been on my list of things to really try to to uh, dive into. The Open Society and Its Enemies by Karl Popper. And as you can see, it's a Princeton Classics, is what they call them. And all the Princeton Classics have this nice little uh, bottom bar here with the tab that identifies it. Um, interesting, interestingly enough, I guess, this version of The Open Society and Its Enemies has a foreword by George Soros. Don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> but uh, anyway... <laughs> um, this is a one volume edition. Um, so we have a foreword by Soros with an introduction by Alan Ryan and an essay by E.H. Gombrich. But yeah, one volume edition and um, the little bit that I've read already uh, tells me that I, read, I need to not be reading five other books <laughs> at the same time. Um, so there needs to be a lot of note taking. We've got like this section here on Plato's descriptive so sociology here. All right, lots of Plato. And in fact, a friend told me I probably should start off by reading, oh, you know, the major works of Plato. Um, just to, you know, wet my feet because this is really a discourse on a lot of the, you know, uh, Platonian philosophy. It also includes Marx and Hegel, but let me read you. Uh, for those of you not familiar with The Open Society and Its Enemies. Uh, one of the most important books of the 20th century, The Open Society and Its Enemies, is an uncompromising defense of liberal democracy and a powerful attack on the intellectual origins of totalitarianism. An immediate sensation when it was first published, Karl Popper's monumental achievement has attained legendary status on both the left and the right. Uh, tracing the roots of an authoritarian tradition, represented by Plato, Marx, and Hegel. Popper argues that the spirit of free, critical inquiry that governs scientific investigation should also apply to politics. And a new foreword, George Soros, who was a student of Popper, describes the revelation of first reading the book and how it helped inspire his philanthropic Open Society Foundations. Interesting. And some of the quotes, the blurbs that in support of this book, like we've got a quote by Vaclav Havel, where he says Karl Popper was right. Um, let's see here, um, Bertrand Russell, a work of first class importance, which ought to be widely read for its masterly criticism of the enemies of democracy, ancient and modern. Hugh Trevor Roper, he just said magnificent. So, um, yeah, this is a big chunkster of a book. It's big, fat, and heavy. 
like me after a meal. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. I don't I don't eat that much. Um yeah, so volume 1 is the spell of Plato. We go into Plato. Uh, volume 2, the high tide of prophecy. And that looks like Hegel and Marx. Um yeah. <laughs> It's heavy stuff, heavy duty, man. I got to make sure my my um, my reading table is f free of other distractions to really take this one on. But the price was right; it was on sale, and that's the only time I could afford a brand new edition of this book. Um, yeah, it's, it's normally thirty dollars, twenty nine ninety five for the the paperback. I think I got it for half that, so I was happy. Um, and then the next book is a straight up work of fic fiction, uh, history. <laughs> um, and this is to go along with my studies on the French Revolution, which has always been a, an area of interest for me. And this is 12 Who Ruled, The Year of Terror in the French Revolution by R.R. R. Palmer. You see that? Again, this is a, a classics. They, they're, they're beautiful editions. They're just beautiful. Um, yeah, the reign of terror continues to fascinate scholars as one of the bloodiest periods in French history when the Committee of Public Safety stro strove to defend the First Republic from its many enemies, uh, creating a climate of fear and suspicion in revolutionary France. R. R. Palmer's fascinating narrative follows the committee's deputies individually and collectively recounting and assessing their tumultuous struggles in Paris and their repressive missions in the provinces. A foreword by Isser Wallach explains why this book remains an enduring classic in French revolutionary circles. So fantastic. Um, you know, I really was looking into this before I bought it. I wanted to make sure it was one I wanted. Um, but he lists off here like the 12 that he's focusing on. Uh, a lot of the names I don't recognize, so I know that there's an opportunity here, again, for me to, like, round out my knowledge of French Revolution personalities, from, you know, the the leading lights, or I wouldn't call them lights, but you know what I mean. Um, yeah. Let's see here. Yeah, a lot of these I just don't even recognize. But um, it looks fantastic. Um, oh list of illustrations. I know Robespierre, obviously. But um, here's one guy, Couthon. Anyway, it's just a nice, nice edition, half off. And I was like, let's add it to my French Revolution collection. Okay, so the next two books are not cla the Princeton classics, but, you know, they're history. And I love history uh, at the history shelf. <laughs> um, so I read this one as far as I, well, I didn't read it, but I, I read the description and I went into the table of contents and I really wanted to make sure that it was one I wanted. But you know what? I'm always trying to round out my knowledge of different countries and their histories. And um, this is one I haven't really studied in depth before. This is the Hungarians, A Thousand Years of Victory and Defeat. And the subtitle intrigued the hell out of me. A Thousand Years of Victory and Defeat. It's a new edition, and this is by Paul Lenvi. Lenvi. Uh, and up, this is an updated new edition of a classic history of the Hungarians from their earliest origins to today. Uh, in this absorbing and comprehensive history, Paul Lenvi tells the fascinating story of how the Hungarians, despite a string of catastrophes in their, and their linguistic and cultural isolation, have survived as a nation for more than 1,000 years. Now with a new preface and a new chapter that brings the narrative up to the present, the book describes the evolution of Hungarian politics, culture, economics, and identity since the Magyars first arrived in the Carpathian Basin in 896. Through colorf colorful anecdotes of heroes and traitors, victors and victims, revolutionaries and tyrants, Lenvi chronicles the way progressivism and economic modernization modernization have competed with intolerance and narrow-minded nationalism. An unforgettable blend of skilled storytelling and scholarship, the Hungarians is an authoritative account of this enigmatic and important nation. So and really that sold it, sold it for me. Um, and it's a very nice, a very nice addition. 
So I picked that up in the sale. Um, and then this one. It's a bigger book. It's, it's, and it's just beautiful. The, it, it can lay flat just about. But it covers a very grim um, part of history. Uh, I think it was during World War I. Yes. And, you know, it still bothers me to this day that the nation that perpetrated this won't acknowledge that they did this. This is about the Armenian Genocide. This is, they can live in the desert, but nowhere else. A History of the Armenian Genocide by Ronald Grigor Sunni. Um, and this, this book has been out for a little bit. I'm just now getting it. I have another book on the Armenian Genocide. Oh, what's it called? I can see the, I can see the jacket cover. Um, it's, uh, this came out in 2015. And this, the Ronald Grigor Sunni, I recognize him from another work he's done. Um, but anyway, it's a very striking cover. Let me read this to you real quick. And this is the last book. And then I'll let you all go. All right. Let's see here. Starting in early 1915, the Ottoman Turks began deporting and killing hundreds of thousands of Armenians in the first major genocide, genocide of the 20th century. By the end of the First World War, the number of Armenians in what would become Turkey had been reduced by 90% more than a million people. A century later, the Armenian Genocide remains controversial but relatively unknown, overshadowed by later slaughters and the, and the chasm separating Turkish and Armenian interpretation of events. In this definitive narrative history, Ronald Sunni cuts through nationalist myths, propaganda, and denial to provide an unmatched account of when, how, and why the atrocities of 1915-16 were committed. Drawing on archival documents and eyewitness accounts, this is an unforgettable chronicle of a cataclysm that set a tragic pattern for a century of genocide and crimes against humanity. You can see it's a, a bigger volume than the others. Um, I think I've read his work before. Ooh, sometimes I just look at that, it just kind of lies flat. So, um, yeah. I definitely, these were the four books I just, I was like, okay, I'm going to get these four and that's it. <laughs> because, you know, I had that massive Princeton University Press book haul, or two of them, I forget. Oh, uh, last year, is it last year? Oh, God, I got so many of them. Or was it earlier this year? I don't remember. It was in the winter. I had an itchy buying trigger finger online. Anyway, so guys, those are my books. Those are the new books from publishers with a great stack of options if you guys are interested woo! and then some Princeton uh, books Princeton University Press books that you might also find intriguing all right well I'm going to end this here I hope you guys are having a great day and evening and we will talk again soon book dube take care bye